are we? <laughs> I am Liana. My friend sent me a text before I went on stage and told me I was top 20 qualified people to talk about being Liana Rossi, which really helped my confidence. Um, so if any of the other 19 would like to get up here with me, you're more than welcome. Uh, and hello to everyone at home. I'm pretty fucking nervous. That just made it sound like I do this all the time, which I certainly don't. And most recently, they've been in the safety of my ho own home over Zoom. So um, IRL is a bit of a shock to the system. I always struggle to succinctly explain what it is that I do, which is pretty ironic for someone that spent a decade working in comms, like I should be able to say it by now. So I've usually been firmly placed in the social sphere, and that's like changed so much over the time that I've worked in this space. It's gone from creative strategy, production, art directed, styling. I kind of reject the jack of all trades notion because I would like to think I'm good at some of it. So I got a new job. I'm at Ogilvy, my title is Head of Culture and Influence, and I still have a little bit of trouble saying that out loud because I'm not exactly sure what it means yet. I am working it out, and especially if I have any colleagues in the room or on the call, I promise I've like, got it under control. So I've been at Ogilvy for like two seconds, and I have nothing to show you guys because I haven't done anything except meet a bunch of people. So what I'm going to do is talk you through my work from the last five years, more or so, and some of my experience in the past decade that's led me to this new job and this new title. So, obviously a weird life adjunct to be at, to not have any work to show, not exactly how I saw this happening in my head if I would ever imagine it. Matt got in touch with me as I was resigning from my job, which is also a very weird time for someone to hit you up and be like, come and talk about your job, that you're quitting, <laughs> that you fucking love. Um, but I had heard about a new opportunity that really excited me and I was ready to throw myself at that. So there's been a definite running theme of Matt's persuasiveness wherever he is, but like everyone has been convinced to get on this stage against their own will. You can't see them holding me in here. I was in this job that I probably could have stayed in forever because it was so fucking fun and we made so much work, so much work in our little team of legends. There was like 14 of us when I started and we worked across all of Mona's brands and again, I could have stayed there forever. I really want to shout out some of the creatives that I worked with while I was there. Robbie Brammel, who is a legend, who called me up one Sunday afternoon and offered me the job. Jordan Anderson, head of creative, most brilliant female creative I've ever worked with. Actually, just fucking creative, fuck being female. Jesse Hunniford, photographer, incredible. Heaps of his pictures are in here. I've jacked all his pickies for my talk. So, Jesse, I hope that you know I'm appreciative. Luke Hordle and Michael Blake, excellent writers, Aaron Wassell and David Campbell, designers, all fucking legends. So I was one of those kids that wanted to do and be everything, and I like put my everything into everything for like 10 seconds. So I did piano, I had vocal training, I did dance classes, I went to NIDA and did the Young Actors Studio. I had an agent for a little while, so I learned a lot about rejection pretty young. Um, in retrospect, I was probably one of those kids that should have been teased more, just to like make them a little bit more quiet, but no one did and, you know, it's led me here. There's a bunch of ways I could post-rationalise how I ended up in a marketing and advertising career, like the fact that when I was 16, I played a pregnant teenager in a Suncorp insurance ad, and I made more in that one day's work than I make in a week now. Um, and this is pre-everything being on YouTube. I've tried to find it so many times, but you've all been spared. Um, or that I'm the ultimate consumer and I just love to buy shit. Like, thank you, capitalism. I bought this outfit walking down James Street yesterday, even though I brought 23 kilos of luggage with me. <laughs> or the fact that I basically failed my HSC because I was coding my own MySpace layouts because I wanted my page to look better than all my friends. I also learnt Photoshop so I could pull all the saturation out and then just make like my lips red or something. Like, really fucking edgy. Um, my dad was so furious, he was like, you need to be a lawyer. They're Italian migrants, they're like, what the fuck is going on? He's like, you will never get a job on MySpace. <laughs> and then I did a talk at Facebook and I had that up on a slide and I was like, love you, dad. <laughs> or it's the fact that after my failed teenage acting career, flirtation with fashion design in high school, that I decided I was going to be an interior designer because architecture, too hard, but love spaces. So I would go to this news agency in Wollongong, where I grew up, at Westfield Fig Tree, shout out, 
And I picked up this issue of Habitus magazine, and I think it was probably like 20 bucks, and my mum was like, seriously, like, for this magazine? And it was issue one. I sent them the most unhinged, overly enthusiastic email at the age of 18, offering them all of my services, all for free. I knew fucking nothing. I would come every day. I would pay my own train fare. I just wanted to be there. I wanted to be in that world. <laughs> I was actually texting the marketing, ex-marketing director last night, asking her what she remembered about me, and she said that I was overdressed. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wanted to go to UTS and study interior architecture. I didn't have the marks for it because I paid no attention in school because of MySpace. So I take this marketing internship, and I'm so devoted to it that I take a night course in PR and marketing at TAFE. I'm like, I've got to get my skills up. I'm going to make these people a Facebook page. It's going to be fucking lit. Um, so I go do all of that, spend the next two years there, like a couple of days a week. They just let me come into the office. I felt so important. The publisher was like, who is that girl? Like, pretty regularly. And I'd be like, you know, doing probably illegal things now, like downloading all of their databases to add friends on Facebook and stuff that you definitely can't do anymore. But I was so keen. Anyway, I get into UTS. I drop out of my course within a year. Um, and at that time, I'd started running an online publication with a bunch of friends. We were like, going to be hype beasts, but it was Australia. Um, so we like worked with Adidas, like Sony let us make a video clip. We had no fucking idea what we were doing. We had an office. I do not know who paid for it. We made no money. We just went there. We had like desks and stuff. I look back at this period and I'm like, we were actual children sharing someone's office and we were just like, we are the publishers of the future. <laughs> at this time, I also start writing all of my kind of internal monologue thoughts on Facebook in all caps all the time. So a friend of a friend liked my all caps writing and asked me if I wanted to do some freelance social copywriting at Present Company, which is up the top there. I think that I was the fifth person to join the social team. The agency is huge now. I couldn't tell you how many people are there. It was fucking chaos. <laughs> No one checked our work, and they, maybe they did, and if any clients are here, like, maybe you did. I don't remember it. There was so much autonomy. The internet was the Wild West. No one really respected social media. Organic reach was still a thing. We had, like, 30 million fans on Pringles, and we would make the dumbest memes and get, like, 50,000 likes. Like, this was just, this was, like, the most fun you could ever have at work. I met my really dear friend Renata there. I don't know where she went to sit. Oh, she's waving at me. She wouldn't be my emotional support friend on the stage, but she's here with me for the weekend. We made a lot of memes. Like, we just got paid to make memes. It was so fucking fun. It was like summer camp every day of the week. And I won my first pitch there, which really put a spring in my step. It was for CoverGirl Cosmetics, and we were going to make drugstore makeup very cool. So it feels like at this point, Advertising agencies started to take social media seriously. And then I took a hybrid role at DDB, um, and it had me sitting in a creative department for the first time. So that's when I started to meet art directors, copywriters, understand teams, and CDs, and ECDs, and CCOs, and global CCOs, and network agencies. My mentor, Pete Garms, who I'd met through my stupid website, because he likes sneakers and I like sneakers, suggested that I apply for it. He was a creative director there at the time. It was here we worked on a socially-led campaign for the Sydney Opera House um, called Come On In that won a bunch of medal around the world. It really gave me the confidence that like, the skills I'd been working on might actually be legit. I also learned about TV production. I remember sitting in an edit suite watching like eight people talk about the colour of rendered mayonnaise on a burger, and I felt like I had been dropped from another planet. I was like, what the fuck? This is people's jobs. I also learned how expensive it is to licence pop music. I was like, oh, you know, we were making stuff at Present Company with a probably cracked Adobe. No, they definitely had subscriptions, but you know what I mean. Like, it just didn't, maybe even in MS Paint. Um, so I got legit, is what I'm trying to say. Then I go to Your Pals, which wasn't really a business. And when Ogilvy was writing my press release about my new job, they were asking, um, they're like, what is Your Pals? Was it a company? I'm like, no. I'm like, what, what was it? I'm like, it was just me and Pete, and people paid us for ideas sometimes. So I was like, maybe it was a company. You could say that. Um, so Pete and Liana, pal, Your Pals, we're friends. Um, people used to call me Pete's millennial. <laughs> 
Um, and that's really funny because now I have a Gen Z that I've adopted at Ogilvy, so it's like, you know, it's keep going. We pinged around um, and we spent some pretty sizable stints in big agencies like RGA and We Are Social working on campaigns for some of my favourite brands, which was pretty exciting. Bit of a full circle moment working on Air Max Day after having my failed publication in earlier times. Uh, we were also repped by a production company that was doing experiential stuff. It's now been rolled back into Revolver, but at the time it was Revolver Willow Rourke. Again, we had this like giant activation we worked on at Comic-Con, and I was just like, what is happening? Then I get a call from Mona. Actually, it was during that Comic-Con job. It wasn't actually a call, it was LinkedIn DM, but same thing. Um, my old boss, who was about to be my new boss, had worked at DDB in Melbourne, and he had gone into Mona to try and create an internal agency. He'd asked a few people around in Sydney if they knew anyone who would be good for the job, and my name came up a few times, which I'm extremely grateful to everyone that dropped my name. So I spent five years at the end of the world executing, essentially, one man's privately funded vision. A museum, Monophoma, live music program, two wineries, a brewery, two restaurants, other food and bev options, luxury accommodations, some boats, and then like whatever else David decided to throw into the mix. I think I said there was 14 of us when I started, so we certainly had a bit on. And then Ogilvy called. Uh, it's my old boss is a new boss again, and there's probably a bit of a theme here about keeping in touch with people. Um, so I'm at Ogilvy, and the big part of the sell for me was this idea of using the network, the four offices in the country for borderless creativity, which is really exciting to me because it unlocks different perspective, and I'll get into like thinking about where you're physically located a little bit down the track, but it was, it was very much aligned with what I wanted to do. Um, so I've come full circle, I'm working back with Toby, there's also lots of really brilliant women in the team, and while my career's been really great, I haven't had a lot of female mentors situationally because of where I've been. It's not to say there's not brilliant women in advertising in Australia, but they're a bit harder to get to work with. Um, so there's Sally Kassane, CEO, and Bridget Jung, who's Chief Creative Officer of Ogilvy VPR, and I'm really excited to learn from them. It was actually my mum that really got me over the line with the job, apart from the fact that it meant I was moving home. They'd just launched the KFC degustation restaurant. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, and it was completely sold out. My mum's like, great, you can get us tickets. I'm like, they don't know me. I'm sure there's people that worked on it that want to go. So anyway, it's been a really big half year of realising stuff. And I've spent a lot of time in, since Matt and I first spoke, which is now almost a couple of months, just thinking about my past and where I might be going. So, here's some stuff that I've made, because I feel like I should show you before I get into more uh, internal monologue externalised. Uh, this is some of the work that I feel is really relevant to what I'm motivated to do. So, not all of it is like big campaigns, some of it's small. Um, but Mona really shaped my creative process, and I learned how to work running on the fumes of an oily rag. So, we did not have big budgets, and we were a little group of people. So that audio was playing twice and out of sync and it killed my soul, but that's okay. I'm going to get past it. So that was Mona's first ever brand campaign. David Walsh, who owns the museum, hates advertising. In fact, the first conversation I had with him, he said to me, I don't give a fuck about Facebook and walked away. 
Um, so getting that over the line was a long process. Jardin Anderson and Robbie Brammel had that idea before they actually hired me, and it took us five years to get it to see the light of day, give or take a little pandemic in the middle. <coughs> Those are all real reviews. So Mona's the most one-starred museum in the world. <laughs> Um, one of the really nice things about having the socials in my phone was like every time someone left a Google review, Google Maps on my phone was synced to my work email, so every review would just come up on my phone like nonstop for five years. They're a thing of beauty. Like people are really fucking polarized, and that's what we want. Um, so that was directed by Alex Rogers and made by Finch. We did have some out of home, but we don't have huge budgets, so sorry, Queensland, we could not afford to put them here. This is Kirsha Keschler, artist, troublemaker, and David's wife. She was commissioned to do an AFR story, um, and then I spoke to the art director of the magazine that was being relaunched, and we kind of jammed a bit, and he was like, well, if you could get like four or five photos, maybe it could be a double page spread, and that was like quite the challenge to me, so I'm like, let's go. Um, so this is a Futuro house that's been fully um, redone, which is very cool. But my favourite part about this is that not only did we cover the AFR mag, we covered the Australian Financial Review the week of the election. <laughs> Next to a story about Frydenberg. Uh, so that is a, felt like a very big goal. This was also shot by Jesse Hunniford, who's, I said, most of his pickies are in my presentation. So Mona closed in 2020, pandemic-themed reasons. Post-COVID, we had to do a bit of a soft reopening, and we were trying to get locals in who historically didn't come to the museum. So we launched the Faro Experiments, which was kind of an evening dining option where the chefs flex different themes, and you know we had to, again, try and get Tasmanians to go two kilometres down the road. Very hard. Um, so <laughs> this is like, I don't know, four of us did this with hair and makeup and tried to make it all together. So I feel really proud when I look at these images, knowing how small that crew was. We made a video that we filmed from across the peninsula and Jesse and Robbie went out on a dinghy and then I couldn't see them anymore and I actually thought they had died. Um, <laughs> anyway, stuff that we got up to. That's my arm. If you go to Mona, my arm or hands are in most photos. I'll have to say on that. So we love an in-joke. Mona's void bar made some rum. The gag was that the boss loves rum and drank us dry. So we made an, an ad of fake CCTV footage. That's one of my colleagues in a wig. That was so convincing. Some of David's lifelong friends text me and ask me how I got it. And then other people were like, wait, that's not where the cameras are. Um, so some people, some people were onto us. I don't think he's seen it. I think he would have fired me if he did. Um, I also appear as a security guard at the end because, again, small budgets. And It's not often you get to make those jokes about your boss or put them on the internet. <laughs> um, anyway, silly and fun stuff. Mona also had an evolving food philosophy. So at this point in 2018, they were still serving pork in the restaurant. So the chefs and the bartenders had an idea to try and use as much of the beast as humanly possible. So they were like, what if we made a margarita and the ice cube had an eye in it, and you needed to drink it really fucking quick so you didn't end up with an eye in your mouth. <laughs> so, like, that is not a back, and that's, like, I don't think you're allowed to advertise like that, but anyway, bear with me. So we made, we made this, Jesse and I did this image, which I've zoomed in on, but it's, like, big, beautiful glass, really nicely shot. Like, of course it goes viral, lots of angry vegans. Um, <laughs> But I think the broader conversations that we started to have about if you're going to eat meat, you should be able to look it in the eye is quite nicely <laughs> captured there. The world needed soap in 2020, <laughs> so we sold it online. So that's the Mona comms team singing in a hallway. 
And my boyfriend was working in the same office building downstairs, and he was like, what is going on up there? Are you guys okay? I'm like, oh, we're making an ad. Um, so Moo Brew Brewery, which is Mona's Brewery, had a beer called Hef. No one drank it because it kind of sucked, but the people that really did like it were pretty upset. So he brought it back for some loyalists. Resurrected, get the pun. Um, I called Callum Preston, who works with Scoundrel, who's Melbourne-based, and was like, hey, could you, like, build me an evil Jesus beer tap? And he was like, yeah, okay. I'm like, I need it in, like, two weeks. Is that cool? Um, so he came through in the clutch for me there. This was the mushroom at Monophoma just this year gone past. We basically got shrooms to make music and accompanying, uh, accompanying visuals um, through a hooked up mycelium network. It was made with the Glue Society. Shout out to JK Scott and Henry for dealing with me on this one. Um, all of those screens are recycled LED screens that you could only see what was on them if you were wearing a polarized lens. So there was like layers to the experience and like working with shroom people is pretty fun. I think I missed a shroom talk yesterday. Yeah, I'm like, everyone keeps fucking talking about it. I'm like, I had shrooms. <laughs> So, we needed to drive awareness for Mona's Summer Festival in Launceston. And I know when you think of summer festivals, Launceston is exactly what you think of. So, we got Qantas to work with us and give us a Boeing 737 and we gave 160 seats away to one person. They had to be able to fill it with their friends. First person to find it on our map of Tassie won the whole thing. Shout out to Tim Strange, who was also from Wollongong. I did not know him, it wasn't rigged. This is the Titan of Trash and there's a photo of him in the green room out the back and I'm so fucking thrilled to just see him everywhere. Um, if you're a theatre kid, you get it. John Waters, this is just like part humble brag, part like pinch me moment. We spent a lot of time trying to get artists to let us do anything that were our ideas. I don't know if you've met artists, but they have their own ideas. So we were like, please, John Waters, review the museum. Just tell us we suck, like, you know, roast us. And he was like, no, but you can take a photo of me. <laughs> and his agent was like, this is a big deal. He doesn't let people do that. And we're like, oh, fuck. So I'm like styling John Waters in a back room at Mona and Jesse's trying not to die. And then he said he liked my outfit and I'm going to die happy. And we're just all dying at this point. Look, I am the first person that's fully aware of how ridiculous this is. I'm an adult man that sits on a box for a living. It's completely idiotic. I sit on that box every day and go, you've got to be kidding me. But what I've experienced uniquely, there's nobody in the world that can share this with me and go, I know what you're talking about. No, they don't. And I'll do nothing. Nothing. And that's what my talk is about. My talk is my, my verbal healing that I get to do twice a week when I spend my life in silence and I have the opportunity to be with people that I don't know and share everything about me that there is to share that you don't see. And I've done that over 200 times here at Mona and every time is a wild experience. And that completes the picture of the guy on the box. Oop, didn't mean to do that. It really doesn't want to. Okay, so that's Tim. He's got skin in the game, quite literally. When he dies, he'll be skinned, 
and a German art collector who purchased the artwork on his back for 150,000 euros will receive it framed. So here's a conceptual artwork by the artist Wim Delvoir. And I think this is interesting to include. This is from 2018. He sat six months of a year at Mona up until COVID, something like 4,000 hours sitting on boxes. But like, this is the kind of subject matter that actually became quite normal to me. And then when I talk to people, like I can hear scoffing and they're like, oh, the guy's gonna get skinned alive. And like, I think it's interesting when you pull yourself completely out of the spaces that you come from and then what becomes normal. Um, but that was just a brief to sell some tickets to a talk and we actually sold the whole thing. So that was good. Oops. Okay, so I'm gonna try and articulate my internal monologue for you, like some guiding principles that I like pep talk to myself in the mirror, especially when I was thinking about changing jobs. So I'm not a futurist. I don't really look ahead. I don't, I'm not good at planning. I like did all of this last night. Like that's completely my vibe. Um, I spend more time looking in the review mirror and just making sure that I'm taking what I learned with me than like trying to figure out what comes next. It's like completely contradictory, which is where life gets spicy. So bear with me. How does all of this manifest for me? It manifests as being surprisingly professional. Early in my career, a creative director turned to me as we were leaving a meeting at a really big client's office and said, you were surprisingly professional today. <laughs> and I'm a smart ass. So I was like, one day I'm going to write a book and I am going to dedicate it to you and your name is going to be in the front page and everyone will know that you said this. Um, no book yet, but I have co-opted it and it's actually become like my personal North Star. I'm like, is this surprisingly professional enough? Am I doing it right? I don't even think he would remember saying it. And yeah, I'm claiming it nonetheless. So I think this kicked off my Peggy Olsen era in advertising. I went from feeling really lucky to be there to recognizing everything that I'd brought to the proverbial. And I had to fucking own it. If I had to guess, he thought I was surprisingly professional because I was a young woman, my hair was bright purple, I had bright clothes, a bit of tude, and he was probably a misogynist. <laughs> it's not lost on me that I've spent the better part of eight years trying to understand, define, determine, implement his throwaway comment. It's like, get over it, um, but I can't. So what the fuck is being professional anyway? I tried to Google it, it's extremely boring. I don't even understand what that's trying to tell me either. And like, it's always like, to be professional, you have to be professional. And I'm like, no one will define professional. Who am I seeking permission from? Like, are they in this room? Is the gatekeeper of professionalism here? When I started working, I tried to draw a really clear line between like, very serious Liana Rossi and like, unhinged Liana Del Cray on the internet. And I realized that I was hiding a pretty significant amount of who I was and what actually made me interesting. And that it's also like, basically impossible to hide from people on the internet when you have public profiles. Over the course of my career, I've watched the people around me redefine what it means to be profesh. It helps probably that I came from an agency of outsiders, which loosely translates to everyone was a DJ at one point in time. <laughs> but we've completely rewritten the way that we dress, the way that we speak, how much of ourselves we bring to work. The last few years have allowed us to radically redefine professionalism, right? Move past old school metrics, Systems that created biases and assumptions and inequity, especially for those people not in the dominant culture. This is my dog, Kip. And he used to sit on my shoulder like that for most of my Zoom calls at home, so everyone got real acquainted. He's like a cat dog. I don't know about you, but working remotely for the first time allowed me to access a far more human side of my colleagues. And I'm pretty friendly. I thought I knew everything about them. And I thought I'd shared my full self with them too. But do you really know someone until you can see their kids smashing shit in the background and they're yelling at them? Or like how often they get parcels delivered? It's like you're buying something again? <laughs> like how alive their plants are or if they've made their bed, you know what time they eat lunch now? It's 11.50 a.m., that's me. And who has to do the school run in the Arvo? Dogs are barking, cats are fucking shit up. I got really transparent too, I have endometriosis. I used to just be like, I have a doctor's appointment. And then I'd be like, I'm going to see my obgyn for pain treatment for endometriosis and telling everyone probably more than they needed to know about me. Anyway, who doesn't like surprises? So I surprised people with my professional conduct, we get it. My friend Nada, who I mentioned before, said that I was dressed like a clown today. Um, so we know that it's surprising, but there's power in not fitting in. It's taken me the better part of a decade to really work out how to own it. Even with like a natural contrarian instinct, I can feel myself drifting to the middle at times and trying to do things that are socially acceptable. 
Because it's human nature to want to fit in, but we should really, really encourage the people around us not to. We have to encourage individual quirks. This has been, especially starting a new job, I've been thinking about it so much. I'm like, how do I fit out? How do I not become the people that I am because they want me as the person that I am? How do you make sure the stuff that makes you, you, you still apply it to your way of working and you don't lose it? So I'm not going to go full Miranda Priestly on you, even though I definitely wanted to put the whole clip of this scene from the movie in here, but I didn't. Oh, am I already over time? That's shocking. Okay. It's like now I'm not going to let me look at anything. Sorry, guys. Um, anyway, we're in a room full of people who care about how stuff looks, right? We get brands. We make decisions that influence how we're perceived in the world. So it's like how do you brand yourself? I physically push away from the norm because it's a shorthand that I'm significantly other. Like it was experimental when I was a bit younger and, and now it's just fun to do. It's also a bit of dopamine dressing. But the, losing the professional norms aesthetically, aesthetically gave me the confidence to really show my quirks. Online it's like depressing memes that make people ask if I'm okay. But you have to, <laughs> you have to zig when they zag. Be confident in your experience as a human being. Like when I talk about my career, I used to gloss over the stuff or not even mention the things I did in my early 20s because they weren't like a boss. And, and I'm like, I like designed a pop-up bar with Fashion Designers Romance was born. My friend Michael's fashion shows, I did his invitations. Now his clothes are in 007 movies. I like look back on it retrospectively and realize the union of what I learned, mainly throwing parties <laughs> on the dance floor, was really important to come together for, with a meeting room. Because people can tell when you're not being yourself. And if this industry was built on misfits, and I'm sensing a theme that most people have just found themselves here, then we have to know how to actively fit out to be the misfit. I spend a lot of time in my own head or in the notes section of my phone, and I have to physically get out, go for a walk, get lost in something to have any semblance of the crumb of an idea. I never realised my dream of living overseas until I crossed the Tasman. Hobart was my London. This is an artwork at Mona by Ryoji Aikida, shot by Jesse Hunniford from the top of Kunanyi. Uh, and it shoots 15 kilometres into the night sky. I love it in this photo particularly because everything's so fucking small and nothing matters. My boyfriend was nervous for me to include this tweet, but I tested it on the Made in the Pile guys who are from Perth and they liked it. This was in reference to the votes from the federal election, but if being back home in Sydney has taught me anything, it's that Sydney and Melbourne are very quick to forget that there are any other cities in this country. So we should all be looking to Brisbane, the progressive centre of Australia. Yes. This is a non-exhaustive non list of shit I have to remind myself to do. Diversify the media I consume, destroy the algorithms, leave my fucking bubble, leave my fucking city, throw my phone into the river, go down a rabbit hole, shut up and listen, ask questions, drop guard, jargon, read print, experience in the wild, question everything, find a mentor in another industry, talk to your friends about their jobs, subscribe to literally anything, identify your viruses, spiral on TikTok, do the pub test and eat the rich. And finally, <laughs> ignore well-intentioned advice from strangers like me. Am I really this over time, or is this out of sync? <laughs> I was like, I'm like, I'm going to run for like 15 minutes. It's going to be fucked. Now we're here. Um, okay, make art that sucks. Write shitty poems. Record a terrible song. No one will ever know, or show everyone. Who cares? Nothing matters. You'll be surprised about what you can learn from your interests and abilities. I know that I fucking hate pottery because I'm impatient. I'm like. You know, capitalism has made us think we need to be able to monetize and be great at everything, but you have to try stuff, and there's something really rewarding and humbling about making something a little bit shit. So get a hobby. The housewives think so. The thing for me that's been really hard is that I'm like not a photographer and I'm not a designer and I don't actually have a tangible output, so harnessing my relationship with creative insecurity has been probably the hardest part of all of this, but once you can do it, it really drives you to be great. It's okay to be a generalist, is the takeout there. You can be good at a few things. Should I stop? <laughs> <laughs> it's a really aggressive slide, sorry. Um, quickly, find jobs that don't exist yet. You have to be realistic. You can't just make them up. You need to build, ca build cases. 
But interviewing's a two-way street. Talk to people, apply for jobs, read PDs, identify what you want to be, and find out why it should exist and where. This is still definitely how I'm feeling, having learned X and pivoted to Y. <laughs> Self-promote. That's it. Self-promote. It's important. There's a weird tall poppy thing and you're worried what people are going to think, but just give it up. This is really good advice someone gave me and I think about it often. You can take a deep breath, reassess, you can run five minutes over in your presentation. <laughs> Look around your table regularly and audit it. There's not a day that goes by that I am not acutely aware that I am a woman and while it has served me in some ways as a privilege, it has definitely hindered me. d &I is not a KPI, it's not passive, it's a cultural imperative, your business has to do it, it's fucking mandatory because of stuff like this, right? <laughs> that was this week. In the same week, I looked around a meeting room at work and realized that half the females were creatives were women, and I was fucking thrilled. So, you know, ebbs and flows. Because you can't manufacture lived experience. It comes back to letting go of that creative insecurity and knowing when you can bring people into your room. Make sure that you're in someone's corner. Don't worry about who's in yours. Band together, use the force, burn the fucker down. This is going to be me once I walk off stage. I'm like, what did I say? Um, ultimately, I find it hugely complimentary when people are confused by me. Um, I don't think people think about me that often, so when they take the time to be like, why the fuck would you do that? I'm like, thank you so much. <laughs> Stay unpredictable, friends. Thank you. <laughs>